Hola, ni amigos. Welcome back to my channel. Today I will react to this video, The French Revolution Oversimplified Part 2. In the last video, I explained why French peasants were having hard life, Japanese peasants were also suffering from uh, poverty and starvation. On the other hand, Japanese shogun and daimyo, I mean lords, they're having lavish lifestyle. Since there was no big war during this Edo period, I think I can say Japan had relatively peaceful time compared to France. Okay, let's watch part two then. King Louis and his family were now in the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where for the next couple of years, he watched as a revolutionary government began to strip away his power. And fearing for his safety, he had to stay on their good side. Hey, look who it is. It's my favorite revolutionaries. Yep, I'm your number one fan. What can I do for you? Hey, King Louis, so we've made a few decisions. First, all of your friends in the nobility are going to have to pay taxes the same as everyone else. Great idea. I love it. And as a side note, the tax money can no longer pay for all your lavish parties. Great. I hate those parties. They're so awkward. And also, we're taking away your Porsche. Oh, come on! I mean... Yay. The king continually found demand after demand being made of him to prove his support for the revolution. On one occasion, a mob would invade the palace and demand he wear the revolutionary bonnet. This is the face of a man who is definitely pretending he wants to wear that bonnet. So they demanded it. I didn't know that bonnet was that important. Around here, I want to mention that one thing King Louis had a problem with was people constantly raiding his palace. But one thing he didn't have a problem with was raiding noobs on this video's sponsor... Let me skip this ads. Seeing the situation rapidly turning against him, the king decided it might be a good idea to leave France and mount a campaign to retake his country from abroad. Luckily for him, he was married to an Austrian. So on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king and his family disguised themselves as servants and attempted to flee to the Austrian Netherlands. The royal carriage made a stop in the town of Varenne, and the postmaster there was like, Hey guys, what's up? Where are you off to? We are but a collection of inconspicuous servants heading for the border for no particular reason at all. Say, you, the fat one, you look kind of familiar. Aren't you the king? Nope. Let me see your passport. It says here you're King Louis the Sixteenth. Nope, not me. Take him away, boys. The king was promptly returned to Paris. I think this is very common for all of us. When you study history, you are not very sure about the, the location, the geography. In my case, I wasn't very sure about the location of Paris and the, the Versailles Palace. By the way, do you know where Tokyo and Osaka are? Even I'm Japanese, I wouldn't know if I hadn't lived in those cities. But now, the jig was up. His lack of support for the revolution was clear to all and many considered him a straight-up traitor who tried to abandon his people. As a result, the new constitution of 1791 completely reduced his powers to that of a simple figurehead, a constitutional monarch. However, radicals, such as those in the Jacobin Club, were outraged that the king wasn't to be removed entirely. So a month later, these radicals staged a protest on the Champ du Mars, calling for the king's removal. The government of Paris feared an insurrection was mounting, and they sent the military to disperse the crowd. The confrontation escalated and resulted in the Revolutionary National Guard firing on a crowd of revolutionaries. It was a massacre. The incident exposed a deep division within the Brotherhood of the Revolution. On one side, the moderates who wanted to keep the king as a figurehead. On the other, radicals who wanted to see the king depose and heads roll. In the wake of the massacre... At that time in Japan, Hokkaido wasn't a part of Japan. Since the Ainu people, the indigenous people living in Hokkaido, they control the, the big land and the Japanese government, Edo government, tried to expand it. These radicals received a wave of support. And speaking of rolling heads, one form of equality the revolution introduced was equality in execution. This meant no more torturous drawing and quartering, no more inhumane hanging. They wanted all criminals, regardless of economic status, to receive the same penalty, a quick and painless one. Luckily, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Guillotine had an idea. A heavy blade that falls like thunder, the head flies off, blood spurts, and the man is no more. The guillotine, otherwise known as the National Razor. The guillotine made its debut in 1791 as the new form of execution. The writings of Marat and others continued to call for the execution of anyone suspected of working against the revolution. For him, this included some members of the clergy and nobility who had previously benefited from the cruel system of inequality that existed before the revolution. 
in many parts of the countryside, local lords had found themselves become a target. About 150 years after the French Revolution, Japan also started guillotine execution under the influence of Germany. Actually, capital punishment is legal penalty in Japan. It is applied in practice only for murder, and executions are carried out by hanging. Sire, the peasants, they're revolting. Oh, come on, that's a bit harsh. Sure, they smell a bit, but I wouldn't say they're revolting. Oh, yes. I see what you mean. Increasingly, these French aristocrats began fleeing France to find solitude in other parts of Europe. And once again, fear began to take hold. The privileged classes of these foreign nations didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own land. The National Assembly, actually now the Legislative Assembly, feared that these nations may decide to attack. Then why don't we attack them first? No, you idiots. We are definitely not ready for war yet. Did somebody say something? France declared war on Austria in April 1792 and immediately got pummeled. It also didn't help that Austria's ally, Prussia, joined in the fighting. The Prussian Duke of Brunswick posted a letter warning the revolutionaries that if anything happened to the king, he would burn Paris to the ground. The Duke's letter proved to be a massive success in inspiring the people of Paris to do the exact opposite. To be honest with you, I didn't remember who was whose side, who was enemy during that time because it, it was too complicated to me of what he intended. They were enraged by the threat, and on the 10th of August 1792, the tension in the city exploded, and a mob stormed the king's palace. Fighting broke out between the revolutionaries and the king's Swiss guard. With casualties in the hundreds, King Louis fled and took refuge in the chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where Robespierre and his radical Jacobins were gaining ever more power. Given the developing situation, the chamber decided to hold a vote, and in what some considered to be a second revolution, it was decided to suspend the monarchy entirely. King Louis XVI was now just plain old Louis, and he was sent to a prison cell where an eye could be kept on him. A month later, the newly established National Convention officially declared the French Republic, and society underwent a massive change. Enlightened ideas of democracy and equality were being implemented, but very quickly, these ideas seemed to become secondary to fear, paranoia, and a thirst for blood. I didn't know how controversial this French Revolution is. When I was a student, I just recognized it as a star of democracy, and I completely forgot about the dark side. The Republic began working to violently remove any semblance of the old royalist regime. The church became a prime target. Priests who refused to take an oath to the revolution were deported or arrested. A new state-sponsored atheistic religion named the Cult of Reason was created as a replacement for the Catholic Church. Notre Dame, along with many other churches, had their religious treasures destroyed and were converted to temples of reason. Even the Christian calendar didn't survive, as a brand new revolutionary calendar was soon introduced. Hey, honey, I'm home. Yeah, whatever, jerk. Whoa, what's wrong with you? You forgot. Forgot what? Everything. This entire year. My birthday was on the 3rd of Germinal, our anniversary was the 12th of Thermidor, and you promised that in Freimer we'd go on a romantic weekend trip to Venice. No, I said we'd do that in December. December hasn't been a thing for years. The government of Paris, now under the control of the radical sun culotte. This image is very famous in Japan, but I didn't know what it depicts, indicates. I did some research and I realized this trouser indicates that he's in the working class and uh, this guy is standing up for something uh, he needs. Am I right? By the way, this is how Japanese farmers look like. And rounding up suspected enemies of the revolution and sending them to prison in the thousands. Naturally, a large number of those arrested were members of the clergy and aristocracy. As France's foreign enemies continued to close in, panic spread. Georges Danton made impassioned calls for men to defend the Republic and tens of thousands of troops left Paris for the front lines. However, in their absence, Paris was left to its own devices. As enemy troops arrived in Verdun, the people of Paris feared that their crowded prisons were becoming a breeding ground for counter-revolutionary conspiracy. What would happen if the Prussians reached Paris and freed the aristocrats? Marat believed he knew what would happen. The aristocrats would enact their vengeance on the people. Fearing those they had already imprisoned, mobs descended on Paris's prisons. They broke in, and during the brutal September massacres, aristocrats, priests, and others were tried and executed on the spot. Even women and children weren't spared. I'm not pretty sure if I really studied about this or I just forgot. With over 1,600 victims, word of the massacre spread across Europe. One British newspaper wondered, are these the rights of man? Is this the liberty of human nature? 
But there was still one man in particular that Robespierre and his radicals really wanted to see executed. Austria and Prussia pledged that after they defeated France, they'd return King Louis to the throne. Well, checkmate Austria and Prussia, because he can't return a man to the throne if he's already dead. Citizen Louis Capet was put on trial for treason. Obviously, he was found guilty, but his punishment was less certain. Many moderates wanted to simply deport him, but Robespierre insisted the revolution could only live if the king was dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced to the guillotine. If you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words first. Gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am accused. Wait, you're too loud. They can't hear me. Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Wait, dude. This image is also very famous in Japan. And I still remember when I studied this event, I was so shocked because as far as I remember, no emperor got killed like this and the head was put on the public display in Japan's history. In her prison cell, Marie Antoinette heard the guns fire, signaling her husband's death. Before long, she would meet the same fate. Back on the war front, France defied all expectations and actually managed to push the enemy back. But then more countries joined the coalition against France and it all went to pot again. What do we do? Conscript the masses. The National Convention introduced a conscription law, with each regional department having to meet a certain quota of men for the army. However, not everyone was happy with this new law. You see, while Paris was definitely a hotbed for radical revolutionary fervor, some of the regions outside of Paris weren't quite so keen on the revolution. Some were largely still conservative, still supported the church, and just didn't suffer from that much inequality before the revolution. So as the revolution turned increasingly violent and anti-Christian, many were outraged. Now, they were being conscripted to fight for the new republic they hated. That was the last straw. I didn't get these parts. The revolutionary uprisings erupted in a number of regions across France. Some would last for years, such as in the Northwest, where a large-scale uprising was led by the Owls. Why were they called the Owls? Because their leader was named Jean Owl. Why was he called Jean Owl? Possibly because he could do a really good impression of an owl. Really? That's what we're going with? Owls? Just because this guy can do an impression of one? Hit him with it, Jean. Hoot, hoot. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. The Chouannerie uprising lasted all the way until 1800. In the summer of 1793, the southern city of Toulon invited the British Navy over for some tea and crumpets, and then they asked if they'd possibly like to stay and occupy the city. Being an important naval base, this was a heavy blow to the Republic, who sent a relatively unknown young captain by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte to help stage the siege of the city. Toulon was recaptured by France in the winter, and for his service, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. Of course, Napoleon is super famous in Japan, and uh, everyone has this kind of image. Maybe this uh, painting is super famous as well. I guess many Japanese have this kind of image, handsome and successful leader. But I'm curious, how Napoleon is regarded in France? A good leader or a dictator? In Japan, we still didn't have many guns for each farmer. Some people had guns, but other people preferred to use sword mainly for battle. All ended on the 31st of May 1793 with the National Convention surrounded by radical saint culotte and 29 moderate Girondin politicians arrested. From this moment on, the moderates ceased to be a political force. Robespierre and his radicals would be in almost total control of the government. As for Robespierre, I used to remember in my uh, textbook there was uh, this image. That's why I associated him with guillotine and execution. And this brings us to the story of a woman named Charlotte Corday. Charlotte lived in the northwest city of Caen, and like many in the area, was horrified at the rapid radicalization and increasing violence of the revolution. And the man she blamed more than anyone was Jean-Paul Marat. She wanted to bring peace back to France, and so she did something drastic. She traveled to Paris and told Marat she had a list of enemies for him to publish in his paper. Marat eagerly invited her in for a meeting. So where's that list of enemies you promised me? Here it is. Wait a minute. This isn't the list of enemies. It just says, yippee ki -yay, mother. <coughs> and just like that. I really don't remember about her or this event, but yeah, this image was also in my textbook. Marat was no more. Charlotte was quickly arrested and sent to the guillotine. Her dream of restoring peace, however, died with her. Marat became a martyr. In Temples of Reason, symbols of the dead Marat became the new crucifix. In death, 
he became an even more powerful inspiration for the extreme levels of violence that were about to rip throughout the New Republic. And that's right, here comes the Reign of Terror. If you thought this revolution already sounds pretty violent, well you ain't seen nothing yet. The radicals were now in control, and they believed not only was France surrounded by foreign enemies, but that within the masses, there were also plenty of internal ones too. Individuals not loyal to the revolution, conspiring to bring about its downfall. Robespierre and the rest of the radical faction were having none of it. A new committee of public safety was established with 12 members. Its purpose was to protect the new French Republic from its enemies, Fire and it seven. basically became a 12-man dictatorship with Robespierre as its leading voice. The Revolutionary Tribunal was also reinstated. A special court created to streamline the process of trying suspected enemies and handing out their death sentences. With these two new institutions, Robespierre wanted to scare France's enemies straight. In September 1793, it was announced that terror would be the order of the day. In other words, fear had become official government policy. And from then onwards, we enter into the period known as the Reign of Terror. Spies and secret police were everywhere and watched the people closely. France's public had to be extremely careful what they said and how they behaved. Obviously, criticizing this new system or the government would quickly have you sent off to the guillotine. But that's not all. Even the most minor offense could have you tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Hello, citizen. This situation is very similar to Japan's life during World War II. People were scared and suspicious of each other and betraying your friend to survive. Martin, hello, Monsieur Dubois. Monsieur, did I just hear you say Monsieur? That's the old style of address, my friend. To the guillotine. You know what? I didn't like him, but I do feel kind of bad for the king and his family. Oof, expressing sympathy for the royal family, are we? To the guillotine! Twelve sous for a loaf of bread? That's way overpriced! To the guillotine! Man, this bread line is taking forever! To the guillotine! And you, you look like you're thinking anti-revolutionary thoughts. To the guillotine. Max, we're sending way too many people to the guillotine. To the guillotine! Chop, 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 chop. It was insane. All across France, about 40,000 people were killed for suspected crimes against liberty. 40,000 is a big number, right? And I still remember the number of casualties of Nagasaki atomic bomb. That was 75,000. So yeah, this number is almost half of it. Let's say your neighbor won't stop mowing the lawn at 7 in the morning. Well then all you gotta do is tell the government they've been talking smack about the revolution. And there's a good chance they'll end up in front of the revolutionary tribunal. Maybe they'll even be executed, taking a metaphorical load off your shoulders and a literal one off theirs. The most prominent victim of the reign of terror was a certain Marie Antoinette, who was finally tried and found guilty of treason in 1793. She expected she'd be brought to the guillotine in a royal carriage. Fit for a queen, all the republic could provide for her, however, was a wooden tumbrel. At 37 years old, the most hated woman in French history met her end on the 16th of October, 1793. Did she really have weird hair set all the time? It saved the revolution through terror. Internal dissent was being suppressed. The food situation was no longer quite as bad. Even the French military had got its act together again and pummeled the allies at the Battle of Fleurus. For Danton and his followers, the time was right to try to normalize the French Republic. Hey, Ribs P. So we were thinking that since things are finally going better, maybe we should rein in the terror. And while we're on it, we could possibly start taking it easier on the church. And also try to end this costly war. Hmm. Oh, crap. What's wrong with him? went on, Robespierre seemed to go, for lack of a better term, a bit mental. He was hell-bent on creating what he called a republic of virtue. And for him, this meant amping up the bloodshed even more. Throughout the spring and summer of 1794, executions reached an unprecedented level during a period known as the Great Terror. Even those closest to him found their way to the guillotine if they dared oppose his ideas and actions, and he began alienating himself from the rest of the convention. He created a new deistic religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, along with the new annual Festival of the Supreme Being. Man, I think Robespierre is really starting to lose it. He thinks he's a god or something. Nonsense. Sure, he's gone a little extreme, but he doesn't think he's a god. My children, bathe your immortal souls in the virtue of my republic. Okay, yeah, he's completely lost it. Robespierre's ultimate mistake, however, came on July 26th, when he made a speech to the National Convention, in which he said this, I have in my hand a brand new list of enemies to be sent to the guillotine, and many of you are on this list, but I'm not gonna tell you who yet. I think this scene is very similar to one scene from the Roman Empire. It's on Netflix. What do you think of that? I think we should send Robespierre to the guillotine first. All in favor? 
down. No. Two days later, Robespierre became the final victim of the monstrous terror and paranoia he had created. Many historical accounts of the revolution end here with the death of Robespierre and his terror. But the revolution officially continued for another five years until 1799. Yes, I didn't remember how this ended. What happened between now and then? Well, after the fall of Robespierre, a more moderate political group called the Thermidorians took control of the convention. They wanted to restore stability to the government. Now, Robespierre's allies and other radicals who had fueled the terror themselves became the target of political suppression. Bourgeois street fighters took on the radical saint culotte in the streets during a period named the White Terror. In 1795, the Thermidorians drafted a new constitution and created a government called the Directory with the purpose of preventing power from being able to fall into the hands of a single individual again. As this new government was being established, royalists who wanted to bring the monarchy back to France saw this moment as an opportunity to strike. They staged an insurrection in Paris and battled with the National Guard in the streets Luckily, one Napoleon Bonaparte happened to be in Paris at the time, and he took control of the situation, firing on the crowd and putting down the insurrection. From this moment on, the people of Paris would never again be able to stage a popular uprising and lost their control over the revolution. Many people were still suffering from starvation in Japan, but at the same time, this new culture came out. For his actions, Napoleon became a general and was sent to take control of the French armies in Italy. The new directory remained a fairly ineffective government for the remainder of the revolution. It was plagued with corruption and struggled to keep the economy afloat, and as a result, wasn't very popular. For the people of France, with the strict social customs of both royalist France and the tarragon, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Men no longer removed their hats when talking to women, different classes began intermingling, and a publication began circulating that looked a lot like a modern dating app. It was social anarchy. Outside of France, the war continued. In 1795, France took the Netherlands, where they set up a puppet state. Then they negotiated both Prussia and Spain out of the war. The British attempted to land French royalists in the west to reinforce rebellion, but that plan failed. In 1796, the French planned a three-pronged attack with the aim of marching on Vienna and knocking Austria out of the war. The two northern armies were defeated and forced to retreat. Until just a few years before this, Austria and France were kind of close. It's very hard to catch up with this history. Napoleon in the south, with groundbreaking military strategy, won battle after battle after battle. He pushed the Austrians out of Italy and began closing in on Vienna. The Austrians freaked out and Napoleon oversaw the signing of a peace treaty. He had almost single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28. So maybe it's about time you moved out of your mom's basement. Napoleon became a famed hero among the French people, but his aspirations were still higher. He briefly went off to Egypt and discovered a bunch of gnarly Egyptian stuff, but then the British destroyed his fleet and trapped his forces. I like Nelson, he's a war hero, and I still remember he fought bravery against France. I like his stories. Napoleon, sir, you're not gonna leave us here stuck in Egypt and return to France, are you? Nonsense, my boy. I would never dream of abandoning my loyal soldiers. Wow, what's that over there? On his return to Paris, Napoleon found himself to be extremely popular and the government extremely unpopular, and he started getting some power-hungry ideas. Conveniently, a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyes approached Napoleon and said, Hey man, since you're so popular, do you want to help me stage a coup? Great idea! Let's stage a coup, and then I'll coup you! What? Napoleon, with the help of his politician brother, entered the government chamber, possibly got punched in the face, and finally his troops intimidated the council to dissolve the government and create a new constitution that basically made Napoleon a dictator. The people who wanted democracy ended up making Napoleon a dictator. I think this French Revolution tells us a lot of lessons. By trying something new, you can obtain something different. It may not be a preferable result, but you made this change. I think that is of great significance. French Revolution, born with the great promise of liberty and equality. The common people dared challenge an oppressive system that had existed for centuries. But before they knew it, they found liberty sidelined by terror, equality that possibly didn't quite hit the mark, and an absolute monarchy replaced by an absolute dictator. Napoleon began stabilizing French society. He restored the Catholic Church and got rid of that crazy calendar, among other things. But he remained ever ambitious. He was France's first consul, but he slept soundly at night dreaming of being something even bigger. Napoleon's expansionist aspirations, combined with the ongoing conflict in Europe, would eventually lead the continent into a huge conflict known today as... I think these events are very interesting. 
And yeah, of course, politics is not that simple. One country prospers under a great leader. On the other hand, another one collapses because of a bad leader. Now many countries are trying this democracy. Is it really working well? I guess we still don't know the answer yet. I really like learning history. I hope you like my video. And if you like it, please subscribe my channel. And this boy, I'll learn the soy kokeshi. So if you like this uh, Japanese kokeshi doll, please visit our website. Hope you like my video. See you next time. Bye.